is this, I'm ready to start cutting calories, I'm ready to start working out, I'm ready to start exercising, and this is a tool to potentiate my efforts, or is this a cheat code? If you combine an intrinsic, real, deeply felt motivation to lose weight and all the consequent frustration of not being able to, with the fact that, you know, with a GLP-1 agonist, you can probably get really far if you combine it with clean food and an exercise regimen. This is like a really big boost to your own intrinsic efforts. Hey, uh, we're here a little bit different. You know, you and I have our whole Verveki series. Today, we're talking about a Zempic and uh, Wagovi and Manjaro and all the other names, semaglutide, uh, um, terzepatide, uh, the entire class of medications that come out for weight loss and um, talking about uh, our experience with that. You and I have both used it personally. We've, uh, you know, I've had patients that have used it, certainly, and we see a ton of stuff in the media, as well as, of course, in scientific papers um, about this. Um, and so just, I think we've both had some interesting thoughts on this and interesting experiences, thought we could kind of like throw in our ideas uh, and, and talk about it. Um, sure. Very briefly, for those that are maybe not just coming up, I, I did want to frame um, one aspect of how, or not one aspect, the main aspect of how these medications work. And to make one key distinction is these medications are not increasing anyone's metabolism, hmm. right? All they're doing is reducing appetite, increasing, and, and thereby decreasing the amount of calories that are taken in. And that is the mechanism by which they are producing weight loss. It's nothing else. Right? right. There's no other metabolic or, or not, not that we know. Right. The, it's the effect seems to be primarily from calories. Right. And right. that frames the entire discussion. That's I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Sure. And then, yeah, if you want to kick it off, <coughs> if you have some. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. On. So, um, you know, to further frame the discussion, I think we, we should talk about two general buckets of things. Right. So one is <laughs> what are the concerns that, uh, you know, some people like <laughs> Peter Atia and others have raised about the use of, you know, Wagovi, semaglutide, all of these GLP-1 agonists, primarily their concerns about the amount of muscle loss. You know, muscle mm -hmm. loss is uh, known as sarcopenia, which basically just means a person doesn't have as much muscle as they should. So let's just label the word sarcopenia for your listeners so we know what we're talking Talking about, I'll, I'll be referring to it like often, right? So, uh, you know, Atia and many others, and many studies have come up with, you know, the observation that a lot of these people who are using GLP-1 agonists like Wagovi uh, lose a lot of muscle as well, right? And they're, you know, rightly uh, concerned about that effect. And there's something to talk about there. So that's like one big bucket of conversation we can get into. And then the other bucket, which I don't think I've really seen anywhere done at all, is. If you are not an OB, I mean, we but we have both used an experiment with uh, GLP-1 agonists, yeah. but you know neither of us is obese, right? Like Correct. we, like if we lose another like ten or fifteen pounds, we're like you know near fifteen to twelve percent body fat, both of us, right? So it's not yeah. like we're we're both in a very healthy weight category and even muscle mass category, uh, and yeah. so we can talk about. Then the question is that if you are an optimizer, right? Then yes. How should you go about thinking about this sort of class of medications, if at all, right? And then we could Correct. we could have that conversation further. So the first thing that I think we should talk about it is is this uh, effect of sarcopenia, this uh, muscle loss that people have when they. Uh, I lose do want a to nuance of, nuance just yeah. briefly. Yeah, sarcopenia on some level is is having insufficient muscle, right? So there is yes. a threshold there that's being pointed at. Mm -hmm. However, you know. I, I don't know if you, I'm not actually familiar with it, a technical sort of like lean muscle mass per body weight, sort of a body fat percentage equivalent definition of sarcopenia. There's a threshold effect there. But what we're talking about here is, is regardless of whether you fall below the threshold of true sarcopenia, mm -hmm. you will you are still losing muscle mass yeah. relative to where you start or right. Exactly. Or you could you, yeah. that's the threat at least now. And that's why I, framing it originally as calorie reduction, that was a little bit the intention was leading exactly into that bucket. So we're kind of on the same page, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, is bodybuilders face that same issue, is that when they, <coughs> historically, when they have been on a cut, they're well aware that getting to competition shape, they lose muscle yeah. often. Right, because any caloric restriction, any severe caloric restriction, mm -hmm. comes with the the threat, or, or with it comes the threat of muscle loss, right? Sure. Uh, muscle depletion, and so 
this is not unique to these medications. It is a calorie yeah. restriction issue. In fact, right? exactly. And, and, and the solutions then, or the, the, the mitigations then, are related to the calorie aspect. It, and, and all the, the wisdom, or, or wisdom, that's an interesting word to apply to bodybuilders, but all the, the uh, awareness of meth methods of trying to minimize that effect yep. um, apply here. And it's not some, that's why I wanted to, it's not some strange new class. It's yeah, not exactly. some strange new yeah. thing, right? It's like, right. hey, calorie restriction of will any kind mm -hmm. will cause muscle loss yeah. if not controlled for very carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess the larger point to make here uh, <laughs> is that GLP-1 agonists like Wagovi are not don't have some unique effect of causing muscle loss that we yeah. just don't see anywhere else in like exactly human right. physiology, and <laughs> it's just so mysterious. Yeah. You know, like oh my God, how is this happening? Right? It's well yeah. understood that if you uh, are are losing or you're you're under eating, you're going to lose both fat and you're going to lose both muscle. This is like well documented by the bodybuilding community. I mean, they knew about this in the '60s, right? So yep. uh, and they had all these mitigation strategies for how to minimize as much as possible the muscle loss that comes when you're trying to cut. So that right. is a well-known issue. Uh, I remember seeing a Peter Atiyah's podcast on this subject, and you know he talked about this whole muscle loss issue. And I was just really taken, I don't know if he was having a bad day or something, but I was just taken by his demeanor when he was talking about it, right? It's like he was saying, oh, we found out that GLP-1 agonists cause you to become a crack addict, right? And, you know, like, <laughs> he, it was such a judgmental kind of, like, you know, he was saying they, they lose a lot of uh, muscle mass, and then he basically just said, you know, so they're just getting weaker, right? And he just said mm. it in this, you know, this a pregnant kind of, like, authoritative uh, way, as if, like, oh, my God, I'm just <clears throat> revealing some fact to you that should stop you dead cold in your tracks from ever considering using these substances, right? And, uh, you know, I want to sure. be clear that uh, I'm not advocating that you use them, and I know that you're not advocating to anybody listening that you, this is an academic discussion on how best to think about the, some of the side effects that would yes. come. Uh, so the way that I look at it, right, is like you take the, coming back to the original uh, conversation, is if you take a very obese person, like, I mean, there's many of them in, in America, right, uh, that, that someone who needs to lose 150 pounds, and, you know, there's many of those people. There's a lot more that need to lose even more than that, uh, you know, 200, 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. But let's just say, you know, run of the mill average, right? You have a person who needs to lose 150 pounds. Like that is a, you know, a nicely obese person, right? That's uh, And there's many of those people in America. Now, uh, whether, and you start giving them a govi and they lose all of that 150 pounds of fat and then they lose an additional 30 pounds of muscle or whatever. I mean, whatever the number is, right? The, some, uh, some large and non-significant amount of muscle is lost also. We all know that, you know, medicine is all about trade-offs, right? And that if you are going to take, you know, a govi and then you lose some muscle, um, is the trade-off worth it really needs to be the question that's asked, Right, because and, uh, if you lose muscle, right, you can you know you can put that muscle back on. It's not a terminal state, right? Like, like oh my, sure. you will never get this muscle back. But sure. if you if you if you're carrying if you're holding on to 150 pounds of fat at the age of 25, and you're doing that for the next 30 years, you are at high risk of all of these metabolic diseases and all of these end organ damages from the metabolic diseases like stroke and heart disease and kidney disease and dementia even that are very difficult to reverse. If not completely irreversible, right? And, and so, and dude, I, I think that just to precipitate this idea, I think the notion this and this is a subject dear to my heart, right? Is we say need to lose 150 pounds, right? But to what end? Need for what, right? <coughs> and and what is the goal? There is important in the sense in the sense that if your goal is longevity, for instance avoiding, you know, some of these diseases, like so on and so forth, well, the muscle loss becomes tremendously relevant because muscle loss is itself an anti-longevity uh, risk factor, right? And so, the, the again, the trade-offs here have to be taken in the context of what is the goal. Now, for you and I, we're both, you know, single, hip, young doctors, maybe not quite so young anymore, but, but uh, you know, and, and so there's an aesthetic aspect to finding a partner. Find, so that's to, you know, the trade-offs have to be in the context of what the, of what sure. the goal is there, right? Like, if the goal is, hey, I'm 200 pounds mm -hmm. overweight, and the weight itself is a threat to my longevity, 
Yeah. Well, my risk tolerance is going to be higher then, right? If yeah. my goal is to live longer. If exactly. my goal is aesthetic, well, my risk tolerance is a lot lower because I'm yeah. I'm not pursuing a longevity goal, right? Yeah. And I think it's very clear that if a person has, you know, 100, 150 pounds of fat <laughs> that they're carrying on, the risk of, you know, the consequent metabolic disease is high enough to perhaps justify the trade-off. And yeah. this is especially true when you also think that whatever amount of muscle loss does occur can be reversed when a person, you know, loses enough weight to where the exercise, you know, regular exercise is feasible. Uh, I mean, if you're 450 pounds, right? I mean, you're not going to be walking mm -hmm. a mile anywhere fast, right? For the right. most part, when you start these medications, it'll be 150 pounds before you really are light enough to start exercising in any significant way. But, you mm -hmm. know, if, if physicians, you know, sort of approach this with saying, hey, listen, uh, at some point in time, you also have to add on exercise to this thing because you're losing muscle mass also, and that's also not good, right? So if yep. you want to, yep. like, uh, minimize the downside risk, then there's there's a plan for that that you should engage with at some point in time. It's not, it's not like you got to do it on day one. Maybe you should lose 100 pounds first and then start, you know, going around the block a little bit. And then maybe you should do like some very light kettlebell deadlifts and work your way up to uh, a, a place where you're you know, reliably protecting and building up on muscle. That is a strategy that's available to you. But if you're, you know, morbidly obese, you know, 400 pounder and you're like that for 30 years, you're going to run into problems that are not going to be reversible at all. No exercise yep. plan is going to fix the fact that you, you know, you've had a heart attack and now your ejection fraction is 15%. Good luck reversing <laughs> that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there comes a point almost like you reach a point of no return metabolically. Mm -hmm. If you're metabolically challenged, if you have end-stage <laughs> renal disease, if you've had a devastating stroke, if now you have atrial fibrillation because you have pulmonary hypertension from your sleep apnea, these all sort of become irreversible. Right, and you know, I'm sure you'll find some guru on YouTube that was promises to fix everything, no matter how terminal it gets. But obviously, you know, me and you, I think we've just seen so many of these sort of terminal end cases sure. of metabolic disease uh, in hospital settings that uh, I am, you know, I, I am optimistic, you know, in the in the overall scheme of things that for morbidly obese people. Uh, GLP-1 agonists are actually a good trade-off as long as we mm -hmm. understand that at some point in time you have to incorporate seriously, if you're going to be serious about your health, incorporate yep. seriously a muscle-building regimen as well. Now, you're also going to have a class of you know people who you know will just like take the Wagovi and sit on their couch watching you know reruns of whatever TV show that you know and that's their life. They have no interest sure. in exercising, no interest at all, and that's that's you know and then you have to think okay those patients are going to get osteo uh, sorry sarcopenia. Yeah, they're going to have muscle loss also. But now they also have like 200 pounds less fat that they're carrying around. So, you know, in a in a world where they were 400 pounds. I still pounds think the trade-off is there. I, no, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think, think so too. That's net positive, yeah. I think it is net. In, in a world where you're yeah. 400 pounds and, you know, a slob and watching TV all day versus 180 pounds and a slob and watching TV all day, you'll probably be better off if you were at the 100. I mean, you're not at optimal health. But on the gradient of good health and bad health, you have moved the slider over towards better health, totally. in my opinion, right? Uh, I, and I that's you know, largely that. because I, I, obesity and metabolic disease is such a huge, has such a high disease burden rate in this country, in westernized countries, that mm -hmm. the trade-off is obvious at the extremes, right? The, the, the heavier you are, the better the, the trade-off uh, and risk, you know. Uh, and that's uh, always the case, right? Profile. I mean, if, we saw that very clearly in some sense with the COVID vaccine too, right? Is that like the benefit of doing the vaccine to of a of an eighty year old, yeah, versus the benefit to a, a thirty year old, right? <coughs> well, versus a five year old where there's almost essentially no bene detectable benefit, yeah. right? Like it, it's just it, it's dramatic because the higher the original risk, the more protective mitigation is going to be. If you're four hundred pounds and you can drop to two hundred pounds, that's going to be hugely protective versus right. your you know, 180 pounds and you drop to 160 pounds. Okay. Well, one of the ways I like to frame this, and I, I actually can't say for certain this is scientifically accurate, so it's more of a mental model. Um, but I, I do agree with Atia on one thing, which is the imp the importance of VO2 max as a, as a risk predictor, right? But VO2 max is a weight-governed mechanism, right? There's, there's maximum oxygen consumption as the numerator, divided by weight, mm. right? And so you can increase your VO2 max by losing weight as long as you don't lose much muscle or fitness 
accordingly, right? And often, for especially for obese or, or out of shape people, the limiter is your cardiac output because they have they don't have trained hearts, right? So even with some muscle loss, because the bottleneck is cardiac supply, which is again, you know, which doesn't change that much, you mm -hmm. you actually would be increasing your VO2 max now. If you roughly believe the figures, and this is, again, this is where we get shaky scientific ground, but just as a mental model, comparing the worst, the lowest VO2 max to the highest VO2 max is protective by about 5x, right? Comparing the, the weakest, lowest muscle mass, or, or weakest actually is the, the correct, to the strongest for highest percentile is about a 3x multiplier in terms of longevity and, and mortality, Right? So if you're not going to work out, if you're just going to sit on the couch, you're not going to protect your muscle, you're going to just accept that you're losing muscle mass as well as fat, right? You are trading off an improvement in a 5x multiplier for a 3x multiplier. Mm -hmm. And that's probably net positive. Yeah, but it's not as positive as it could be if you also did the work of preserving <laughs> your 3x multiplier. Sure. Right? And that's what just my mental model of what you're doing is like, yes, it's net positive, but it could be more positive if you did a little bit of work to mitigate that muscle loss. Yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you I, know, and, and again, the, yeah. the heavier a person is, you know, the more true the risk benefit ratios are. Uh, yeah. The other thing to think about as well is uh, uh, when you get to a healthier kind of or a lower weight, a person may be more inclined, more motivated, you know, because they're more hopeful. They're like, oh, my God, you know, like I've been fat all my life. I'm not fat now. So maybe I should aim higher, right? There's, you know, we have, we often kind of forget the psychological effect of like getting on the scale and seeing the number keep going down towards a healthier and healthier weight. People feel better about themselves. Sure. And that could, you know, open the door to like being motivated, right? Because part of the, the problem of the, you know, the 400 pounder sitting in this couch is, you know, learn defeat, right? Nothing has mm. worked, right? And they're mm. just like, well, I'm, I'm just, this is who I am. I'm just a fat person now, right? Mm. And you take that away, identity shifts quite a bit as well. And, and the person is more likely, I'm not saying they're going to, but they're more likely to potentially engage with uh, vigorous uh, exercise. You know, there's so many transformation stories of people who picked up you know, exercise later uh, in life. That's, that's actually, I hadn't thought about this until just right now, but, but th that's another aspect of the importance of emphasizing that this is calorie reduction. Because so many people tell, the, tell themselves the story, the narrative, oh, my metabolism just won't let me lose weight. I just have a slow metabolism. I just, you know, a, a bunch of like arguments about why calorie redu reduction won't work for me, right? Now, when you use Wagovi and you do lose the weight or, or Manjaro, whatever, the, whatever your drug of, your GLP one of choice is, and you do lose the weight, it's important to realize, oh, okay, I lost the weight because I was taking in fewer calories. Now, is there another way to take in fewer calories? Maybe, maybe not, right? And, and that's an entire discussion on its own. And there's not, again, I think one of the things you and I have talked about is use the tools that are available. If we're blessed to live in a time where this technology comes up and, and you're able to use this as a tool, then that's great. But if, but also if it starts to undo maybe some of the defeatist attitude toward mm. that that you say is that like no okay I've now proven to myself that calorie restriction works for me for my body I actually will lose the weight mm -hmm. right okay well now the the task becomes very focused on well how many calories do I need how do I how do I achieve calorie reduction. Is that with the assistance of a GLP-1 agent, if there are side effects that I can't tolerate, can I come off of it? All these other questions start to come up once you break the defeatist narrative of it, I can't do it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the other thing that occurred to me as well in the criticism of GLP-1 agonists in terms of uh, the muscle loss is that those criticisms are kind of really based on availability bias, right? Because we have all of this data you know, where we do BMI, uh, sorry, we do DEXA scans of people before and after. And so we, we have all these measurements, right? So, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of data is emerging where we can point and say, hey, look at all the fat that people are, uh, the muscle that people are losing. Sure. But any person who is 400 pounds and goes from 400 to 200, you know, not using Wagovi or semaglutide or any of the other GLP-1 agonists, but just because, you know, they saw David Goggins' video and they got super motivated and, you know, they started to just calorically restrict themselves and lost weight, that person too is lost muscle 
mass, but it's just not captured by any study, right? Because no one's really measuring people who through just self-discipline end up like losing weight over a certain number of, you know, months or years. So, you know, everyone who loses a tremendous amount of uh, fat is also losing some measure of muscle. That is across the board. I think the reason that this is being uh, overstated uh, in the conversations about GLP-1 agonists is just because that data is much more readily available to see and comment on. Not that it's a unique phenomena that's unique to GLP-1 agonists and, and sure. doesn't happen in other contexts as well, as, as we sort of you know uh, talked about in the beginning. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I will say too, I mean, we, and we should frame this discussion, right? Like, there certainly are people that lose 200 pounds on Wagovi. Like, those stories are out there. But, you know, the average body weight lost was not, you know, was, I think it was 15%, right? Of, of, of uh, mass, right? Over, over six months or something like that. I think that was the study. Am I, am I remember, remembering that correctly? I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we don't want to also like overstate the case that, you know, overnight you're going to lose. There are a few people who overnight lose 200 pounds, but not, not everyone, right? The average yeah. was, was more modest than that, but only over six months, right? So also not, five years, 10 years, you know, so, you know, the notion there is, is also long-term studies are very difficult to do on anything. You know, yeah. what we end up yeah. doing as a culture is we end up saying, well, we did a study for six months or a year, we're going to throw it out and then, and then it'll be on the market. People will take it for five or 10 years and we'll find out what happens. Yeah. <laughs> right? You, you um, know, a, a, a potentially you know, a better way to, uh, you know, try to <coughs> give this to patients. And, and I say this because I, I had a patient I was seeing in the hospital a few weeks ago who was on semaglutide. And I asked them, oh, you know, have you lost weight? You know, and say, yeah, I lost some weight, you know. And, and she was very like, it like, didn't matter to her if she did or not because mm -hmm. her doctor just put it on her, uh, put it, you know, mm -hmm. on a regimen and said, hey, I think you should start taking this thing. It'll be, it'll help your diabetes. It'll help your weight a little bit. And she was really taking it for diabetes more than anything else. But what really struck me, you know, when she said, yeah, I think I lost a little bit of weight is like, she didn't really care, right? She was mm -hmm. overweight and the doctor put her on it, but she did, she wasn't motivated by like weight loss at all. Like she didn't care. Like the doctor could have given her metformin, sure. right? Uh, and that would have helped her sugar and she would have been just as happy, right? So uh, there's, uh, you know, so many people out there who may be overweight and who just don't care that they are. They're perfectly happy looking the way that they're looking. And, but at the same time, there's a, a large number of people who do care very much that they're, you know, way too overweight and in those situations, uh, if you combine like an intrinsic, real, deeply felt motivation to lose weight and, you know, all the consequent frustration of not being able to, with the fact that, you know, with a GLP-1 agonist, you can probably get really far if you combine it with like, you know, clean, you know, uh, uh, clean food and an exercise regimen. This is like a really big boost to your own intrinsic efforts, right? Um that, I think, is a very powerful combination, right? And that perhaps is a pretty good segue into even thinking about how to use it for uh, optimizers, right, like like me and you. But even for Before people who are not just optimizers, they're just literally just they have 200 pounds to lose, sure. getting them motivated and saying, hey, I have a drug that could really help. But if you also, like, you know, change your lifestyle knowing that you're taking a medicine to help you start eating cleaner, stop you know, eating so much sugar, stop drinking alcohol, all these other things, then the effect will be compounded, Right. And, and sure. that, I think, is a per, a perhaps a better framing. The drug shouldn't be doing all the work for you. You should have an engine inside as well that's motivating uh, your progress forward. And the drug then is potentiating or helping or yeah, assisting. Right. And that's yeah. um, I, I will say, actually, let's let's, uh, you know, I think we've we've uh, uh, adequately discussed this. But what are those those muscle protective steps? <clears throat> Um, you know, the, the, and, and some of them actually, I think, run into some challenges with the GLP-1 agent. So we'll talk about the ones that don't, right? So, um, or at least I'll, I'll start throwing out the ones I'm sure. aware of. So high protein intake, right? So as you're in a calorie deficit, to have muscle protection, you need to be on the higher side of protein consumption. So at least one gram, right, per centimeter of height, um, and I use centimeter of height because, you know, at, 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 with obesity, the per, per pound thing starts to go awry, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe 1.2. You you, it's, it's on the higher side for sure, right, per centimeter of height. 
that's one thing. The second thing is um, uh, resistance exercise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing exercise that uh, is directed at strengthening um, creates stimulus to, that is protective for, for, for the muscle to prevent breakdown, right? And so the other thing to frame is that it probably doesn't take a lot of per muscle group I think one to two sets to failure. They're tough sets, hard sets, right? But it's one to two sets to failure uh, per muscle group on any given resistance exercise per week is enough to provide a protective stimulus, right? Yeah. So you may not be gaining a ton of strength, but you will protect the muscle you have with high protein and with one to two sets per muscle group per week yeah. which is not the biggest ask in the world, right? No. It's not hours and hours and hours per week of working out to, to get that. Now, the, the third bit, I think, is where we run into a little bit of an interesting challenge with the GLP-1s is that many in the bodybuilding community have found that, uh, number one, not cutting as sharply, meaning keeping the calorie deficit modest rather than a severe calorie deficit is more protective for muscle and number two mm -hmm. um pausing your cuts so cut for eight weeks pause for four weeks cut for eight weeks pause for four weeks helps you maintain helps your body reset right on its current weight right that becomes a little bit tricky with the dosing of the glp ones and the timing of the glp ones um <clears throat> is you know can you be on you know, five, seven units during uh, or more, right, uh, uh, of one of these GLP-1 agents um, for eight weeks and then half that for four weeks and then back up and then back down, you know? Mm -hmm. And is that the right way to help preserve muscle mass over the long term of losing 200 pounds or something like that? If we're talking about really significant weight loss, you know, if somebody's taking in enough protein, which is its own challenge, which we can talk about, um, is doing the resistance exercise, but then also, should we be pulse dosing this? And I, I use pulse dosing in a very loose term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, I, I agree with the, your muscle preserving uh, uh, prescriptions, right? Uh, resistance training, high calorie, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, high protein intake, resistance training. Uh, and not being so under a caloric deficit that it becomes absolutely impossible to hold on to any muscle. I think those are the only three. I, I don't think really there's anything else. You know, the, the whole uh, how to dose thing is actually, uh, it, it's a conversation that's really worth expanding upon. And I think we're going to start seeing more anecdotes from the whole bo the bodybuilding community. And, I, and me and you have in the past also remarked on how the bodybuilding community is usually at the cutting edge of uh, science when it comes to uh, issues of for muscle good and preservation. Bad, right? and I mean, fat, yeah, for, yeah, for good and bad. Yeah, they're basically yeah. the the frontier of experimenters, right? And all of the stuff about intermittent fasting and resistance training, and so that all came from the bodybuilding community. And yeah, you know, it's the, a really the, I mean, arrow. Yeah, and all this didn't go from the medical community to the bodybuilding. It came the other direction, right? They're the ones who taught us. Um, so I think you were going yeah, to yeah, but see also, some. but also, you know, I mean, it's it's, it, I mean, that's a those two are great examples actually, um, because intermittent fasting recently was shown not to particularly work well, right? It's just calorie restriction, mm -hmm. right? And so yes, they're on the forefront of experimentation, but they also, as a result, because they don't, they're not doing statistics, they're not using yep. calorie compared controls and all these things, they can get things wrong and come to false conclusions on the basis of anecdote, sure. right? Yeah. So, but on the other hand, particularly in the realm of side effects, I think they have a lot to contribute because they're willing to bite the bullet on way worse side effects than most yeah. people, yeah. right? And, you know, in, in their defense of, uh, uh, you know, not... I'm, yeah, sorry, that wasn't an accusation. It was just a observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what I was saying is that... Um, the anecdotes, you know, of like different things they try at least form the uh, beginning of a hypothesis for a clinical study, 
right? Sure. They're like, okay, this makes physiologic sense, and some people have tried it, and this is what they've reported. Let's actually expand this to a study, right? So that it it sort of gives some credence to you know coming up with the the the, the study to begin with. So you know, mm-hmm. coming back to the dosing thing, which I think is actually a pretty important thing, as as we all know, the uh, the standard regimen is like you take five units for like a week or two, and and then or is it a month? I forget, and then you go up to ten, and then you go up to fifteen, and uh, and you know at least the prescriptions, you know when when you read on <clears throat> up to date or any other sort of uh, website about these medications, is there's really never any consideration to like uh, experimenting with that, right? And you know we know from our like uh, experience with insulin, like insulin uh, is a very you know sort of flexible kind of dosing schedule, right? It's not mm-hmm. as if like there's like one dose of insulin and you just have to like take that much and nothing else. And I'm kind of wondering if perhaps the medical community should be a little bit more flexible when it thinks about uh, how to work around this dosing. I mean, I think physicians should start experimenting as well. Now, there, I'll say two things, though, is that I've read a lot of anecdotes uh, from, you know, uh, very obese patients, right, who say that their appetite suppression just did not kick in until they got to, like, you know, a, a significantly higher dose, right? Yes, so I've heard that there could well. be something to be said about perhaps if you have hyperinsulinemia, then you really have to get ramped up to the higher doses if you're living in a. Or insulin- it's just volume of distribution. I mean, I don't know that it, I'm it could be to that. attribute yep, it, it only. Only to right? to insulin, sure. right? But if you have a certain volume of interstitial fluid, because you're 400 pounds, yeah. you you yeah. are a physical size. You know, right. we're, you know, 50 percent water. So 50 yeah. percent of 400 pounds is is a much larger volume. Uh, sure, and sure. so, yeah, uh, you, maybe, you can come up with any number of, issue. Uh, yeah, any number whatever of whatever the explanation is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it I'm could also saying, be yeah. that you know, if it causes, if I was just giving a counter potential. Exactly. Yeah. If, it, if it causes, if it's a satiety, uh, it causes satiety. Well, if you're 400 pounds, obviously your satiety centers are all completely out of whack. And so you may need a higher dose to assert satiety. Again. Also possible entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, you know, coming to like, you know, the, uh, so I, I will say that, you know, for like the, you know, really obese patients, perhaps uh, the, the dosing flexibility is not available, right? Because there's some people who say, you know, it's only until I got to like, you know, 15 or 25 units that I actually started to feel something and I stopped eating as much. Right, uh, so that might not be possible for the higher, like you know, uh, and, and maybe I mean you have to experiment and try. But the anecdotes seem to suggest that the more obese you are, the more of this medication you actually need. Now, what about the optimizers, right? Which is actually what um, my my more, uh, I, I think the people who are watching well, your well, podcast well, before, are probably before, yeah, I I agree, and we'll get there. I, but but I do want to make one commentary in particular on this notion of dosing. Because Uh the manufacturers are actually going out of their way to prevent that, right? Because if you use it through your insurance, if you get Mm -hmm. Wigovi, it comes in an auto injector. Mm -hmm. You buy a dose Mm -hmm. per dose, right? It's only if you go to a compounding pharmacy and kind of buy it semi-off-label, quote-unquote, X, Y, and Z concerns (coughs) with all the concerns about, you know, processing and sterility and all the things you're buying into something— but yeah. it is kind of unfortunate that part of what they're protecting and part of what the, the manufacturer is doing there is forcing dosages. It's yeah, like, no, 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 there's that, an yeah. auto injector, not you pull it up in a syringe and you can pick any dose you want. Yeah. Because maybe the right dose for you is 12 and a half units. Well, that's not doable. That's not a thing, right? And, and uh, I, I have some concerns with that. I mean, imagine if yeah, insulin yeah, yeah. was that way. Right. No, exactly. Like, yeah, I I I got mine from a compounding pharmacy, so it didn't even occur to me. Same. Yeah, you're cr- exactly correct that uh, the auto injectors don't allow for that flexibility at all, and uh, you know that will probably change <laughs> as this eventually becomes more commonplace. You're so There's optimistic. more compounding pharmacy. You're so optimistic with these. <laughs> I things. mean, it'll change at some point in the future, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, the manufacturer themselves may decide, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the market wants more flexibility. And, and so they, they could come up with like a, a flexi pen, just like insulin, right, where you could just adjust yeah. the dose yourself. Um, but for the, if, you know, for the optimizers, like I, in my own experience, let's talk about our own personal yeah. experiences now. I, I think people might be a bit more interested in, in understanding how people who are not, you know, overweight and may just want to lose like 10 or 15 pounds. Uh, may want to use this thing as a kind of optimizing kind of medication. And, and my, I'll, I'll narrate my own experience with this, is that the very first time I took it, uh, it was semaglutide that I took. And uh, the starting dose of semaglutide is five units. Um, what I did was I just took two and a half units. 
And I found that to be a very like strong effect. It was very, very strong effect. And uh, Same. I, I really ran into problems with uh, like being able to eat enough, right? It was like, it was pretty, it was getting to the point where the only way I could like force enough calories in to like go to the gym and exercise is by like eating ice cream, right? Because mm. like that was the highest concentration of calories of, uh, of food I could find before you got too full. And that was weird. I, I found myself in a weird position where like, you know, I wanted to be healthy and I wanted to like, you know, be lifting more, but I couldn't because I just didn't have the energy to do it at all. Mm. So then I kind of thought about, well, uh, and, and then, you know, at some point in the future, like you know, later on, uh, I, 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 I took a, a five unit dose once and that just completely wrecked me. I mean, it was just mm. like uh, really difficult to eat. And as a result of that, your energy levels are just in the toilet and you can't move. And, and I don't, and you had the same experience. And I'm kind of wondering that if you are, if you're pretty close to your body fat already, and you don't really have a lot of issues with like, you know, controlling satiety and you, you don't like chronically overeat anyway. And then you take this thing, then the effect is a lot more profound, right? And you perhaps meet, need way smaller doses. So, you know, uh, taking smaller doses to begin with, right? So don't go for the five, go for like two and a half or go for just two or go for one, right? That's yeah. one way to like get a, a decreased dose uh, so that you just have like a really small kind of like extra help to control your urge to eat ice cream one day or to control your urge to eat junk food or to overeat on on that Friday where you had a fight with that person that you liked or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just a, a small little kind of like extra boost of a help, right? And it's not even doing most of the work for you. It's just doing a little bit, right? Uh, that's one way to kind of decrease the dose. The other way to decrease it is to stretch it out. And that comes to your earlier point as well about, you know, what if you were to sort of just pulse dose this, right? But what if you take two, mm. you took two units, but you didn't do it every week, you just did it twice a month. You took two units, sure. you took, you know, and then the next time you took two units, it was two weeks after that, right? So, you know, and I have an experiment with that regimen. You know, I, I, I have a mixed relationship with this drug. There's, you know, I, I tried it a, a few times. I found it was way too strong. Then I stopped completely. Then it occurred to me to, like, try a lower dose. Uh, but even the lower dose was, like, a bit too strong. I've never gone down as low as one unit. But now I'm thinking, well, I'll just do the lowest possible ridiculously low dose and know that there's just a little bit something helping me to like prevent from binge eating. Uh, and, and that could be a compromise, right? If you take one unit every two weeks, right? It's a ridiculously small dose, right? But if and, you are and, at, and already now, close you know, to your body fat percentage, that might be all you need. Totally. And, and <laughs> you know, the other thing is, you know, we should be aware as well that we're as we go off label here, as we're kind of like going into these alternative dosing regimens, right? Like we don't have a placebo controlled trial maybe that one unit, the value is placebo, right? Yeah. Is, oh, I yeah. feel like I'm able yeah. to not eat ice cream <clears throat> and thus I'm able to not eat ice cream, of course. right? But if I actually were able to... And by the way, total side note, I'm fascinated by the notion of being able to team up with patients and do N of one studies, right? So if you and I teamed up, right? And I could give, I could create like... Okay, bottle of Ozempic, bottle of saline, right? I put a barcode on each so I can tell the difference after the fact, but I don't even know. We put it in a bag, shake it up, you pick one, you do that for six months. Then I give you the other one, you do the exact same regimen for six months, right? Wash out in between, whatever the thing is. And we see, like, can you tell which one's which, right? Do, or, or, or is it yeah. placebo, right, at that point? Um, it's an interesting notion, I think. Um, and piggybacking on what you said, my personal experience was was very mixed, right? In that, subjectively, I felt like I did have reduced appetite. I felt like I lost interest in a meal midway through, which I usually don't, right? I usually am very eager to eat tons of food, right? Um, and And... That was interesting to me. However, I did not actually lose weight. I actually ended up gaining weight on the on the medication, right? So whatever I was eating versus my activity level, its implication on that X, Y, and Z, um, did not have the effect. So oddly enough, I stopped using it. I was having some acid reflux as well, which I attributed mm. a, as a side effect, um, and started just counting calories, Right. Uh, and and I have lost, you know, now almost 15 pounds, although I recently had the flu. So that 
that helped out. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that that's uh, an interesting notion there for me that that part of what I was trying to do with the GLP one was to avoid counting calories. Mm. I was trying, yeah. you know, and I think the same is true a lot of these things, intermittent fasting and and it, whatever keto or, or carnivore or whatever you're doing. I think all of the, they all do their work by reducing calories, right? In terms of weight loss, the weight mm. loss work is done by reducing calories. But the hassle, and it is a hassle. There, there's a tremendous hassle associated with counting calories. You have to eat very repetitively because, mm. you know, you, you can't really, you know, it, it's too much effort to figure out, okay, let me weigh this piece of thing and this. So you end up kind of like, you know, kind of yeah. picking a couple things, putting it in the app, and then eating those five things over and over again. Um, so it is very restrictive, and it's kind of a pain. Yeah. But... Um, it works, right? You know, at the end of the day, what I found was when I bit off the bitter pill of counting calories and protein grams, right? Um, the, then I didn't perceive any value for myself in the GLP-1 agent sure. anymore because, you know, I, I was already kind of doing the restriction in the way that needed to be done and, and finding my own strategies around that yeah. right i think for you from what you told me you've had a different experience a little bit yeah yeah i i, I think uh it's important to contrast uh, the differences here is one of the biggest things really that uh, i was looking for uh and i've told you this as well off here as well is that i uh i'm a stress eater so if I'm going mm -hmm. through a tough time with something in life, you know, a relationship or I'm unsatisfied with something or whatever it is, right? If I have a tremendous amount of stress in my life, then I will eat. And I often joke that, you know, my uh, I, I can always tell in life, you know, how much stress I had by, you know, knowing how, you know, how much I weighed. Uh, mm. And even though about 80%, 90% of the time, I was usually quite good about making sure I didn't overeat. And, uh, you know, the, but every now and then I, I would just go ahead and like binge eat and undo weeks of like good work, right? And and then as a result, you know, I would like add on a pound and then like <laughs> it, it would happen two weeks later and there'd be another pound. And then, you know, a, a year goes by and suddenly I've gained 20 pounds, right? This is this happened during the pandemic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where uh, that was obviously stressful for physicians at the time. And I, uh, and I had other things going on as well and and I, I gained a lot of weight uh, at that time people have remarked how uh, these GLP-1 agonists have actually helped their uh, addictive uh, behaviors right and uh, we're talking about addictive behaviors outside of just eating which is you know binge eating and stress eating can also be thought of as an addictive kind of behavior the same as like using drugs the same as alcohol there have been people who have anecdotally reported that GLP-1 agonists have helped them with uh, alcohol cessation as well so it it seems to do something with the reward center right that we get from with binge the eating. notion of satiety of enough Right, that's kind of an interestingly broad concept. Is yeah, sure. I mean, that's another angle of looking at it. But you know, there, there's also this thing about we we have some kind of a uh, pleasure you know center that's hit you know when we binge eat mm -hmm. on food or I you know sugar or alcohol or you know whatever else, and this seems to somehow come in the way of that. Right. So where I have found it useful is like when whenever I'm on this, I'm completely disinterested in sugar or like desserts or like, you know, or like bad processed mm. food. I find myself enjoying uh, unprocessed food a lot more on this diet, right? And I have absolutely no desire to like go and eat that pizza or that ice cream or that other junk food, right? Uh, I mean, a lot of that That's is really I mean, being intentional. Yeah, no, I, sure. I that that is a very so I, I mean I know this for a fact because there are times when like I really have mm -hmm. like uh, you know my appetite I've taken too much of the drug like there was one time I took five units and I was just a wreck mm -hmm. for like a week you know and in in a couple of times that that following that that injection. I had to like force feed myself ice cream because I just didn't have enough energy to like go to the gym and do stuff, right? And while I was eating, force feeding myself the ice cream, there wasn't like, oh, this is so delicious, you know? Like I was like, I need, I need calories, and this is just mm. what I need to do to get those calories. I don't have a quicker way of doing it. So, and I've been under eating for three days in a row. I haven't gone to the gym in four. Uh, this is not going according to plan. So I'm going to do something, you know, weird and just eat ice cream to keep the calorie count. But while I was doing that, it wasn't. 
you know, there was a time where I loved ice cream, right? I would just like, it was mm. my greatest pleasure to like, you know, eat a whole like, you know, pint of Ben and Jerry's. But it, th- that doesn't, that feeling doesn't occur at all when I'm, when I'm taking this medication. So I for me, it has been useful. Because it's not, it's not my experience at all. Yeah. You know, I, I, I loved eating the pizza just as much. I just lost interest midway. <coughs> And that's why in, that's why my perception is a little different. Is rather than changing my reward center, my my mm. perception was that it was a fulfillment criteria. I didn't have to eat the whole pizza to feel satiated. I had two slices out of the whole pizza and then lost interest. Yeah. Right, and and um, so it's interesting how we've had different psychological subjective experiences of this same drug based on maybe our pre-existing eating dysfunctions yeah yeah right yeah. like like you know i've not i've not correlated my uh, overeating tendencies to stress that doesn't seem to change much it's a mm-hmm. constant desire for uh sweets and 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 savory foods and and rich foods right yeah um and that didn't change on on the medication for me right um, what, what the only thing that changed was the volume, the amount before I was okay to stop. Um, and and you know all these things, right? In the sense that like that's that was my subjective, m- most profound kind of like thought is generally if I order something, I have almost a compulsion to finish it. Meaning I order, okay, I order Chinese food. It's some processed, you know, chicken, General Sow's chicken, whatever, right? And it comes <laughs> in whatever yeah. it comes in, that right? stuff is awful. Um, <laughs> and, and ordinarily, I feel like I am done when I finish that box. Whatever they put in the box is what I <laughs> yeah, eat, yeah, yeah. right? I've right, completely right. outsourced the volume portioning yes. in some sense, right? the the medication made it so that i stopped at some other point there was some point of satiety where i stopped midway through yeah yeah right and that was an interesting notion to me of what the change was on my on my dysfunction your quote unquote dysfunction if i can put words in your mouth is is more stress related binge related and gives you a bit of resiliency against that effect yeah, um, it, but it also is, gives me what you different. just described as well, right? Uh, I had the same experience. Oh, okay. You know, also, I'd order that, oh, interesting. A, yeah, I'd order a pour. I, I'd order something. Uh, ice cream is a good example. Like sometimes I get ice cream, and I wouldn't finish the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, I've had enough. I, I don't want any more. So it does the yeah, same yeah. thing as well. But okay. I've very much uh, been taken by how you know, even when I'm stressed. Uh, and even if I, in the time of stress, I decide to go out and like, you know, try to eat some ice cream or like, de- you know, dessert because I'm distressed, I just can't eat that much, right? It just, I, I don't eat the same volume of like junk food during times of stress that I used to in the past, right? So mm. uh, even if it, even if I give in to stress eating, I can't really do much with it. I, I can't, I mean, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a meaningful percentage of caloric re- reduction in just the amount of stress eating that I'm doing. Um, mm. You know, if you're okay, you know, there's another like question that I wanted to bring up that uh, we okay. haven't talked about yet, which is, I think, quite important, which is, I think, going to inform also uh, our views on these medications in the years to come, which is what happens to people when they stop taking this medication? And what are the philosophical implications of the answer to that question, right? So because there's two options, right? One is you take stop taking them. You, you were 400 pounds, you took the medication, now you're down to a healthy 160 pounds, right? <laughs> then you stop the medicine. Do you, if you mm. stay at 160 or even you gain just a little bit, you get to 180, 185, and you stay mm. there, you could argue that, okay, this was a net benefit for you if you lost 200 pounds, stopped taking the medicine, and kept the 200 pounds off. Conversely, and what we're seeing anecdotally, and I don't think there's like really, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, really robust data coming out yet, no, the people who seen. stop taking this medication, they're anecdotally reporting that they just gain all the medicine back, uh, all, all of the weight right back, yeah. right? And then that really raises a philosophical, uh, an important philosophical question is that what well, does that mean that we have to be on these medicines forever? Like you, yeah. you start at age 30 and then you stop when you die at age 90. I, I really, str- I, 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 I'm highly resistant to uh, this being a lifelong medication for anybody, 
right? I, yeah. I just in my mind, right? Because I think the larger issue here is that uh, at least in the West, we live in a toxic food culture, uh, and that's not just like portion control. I think that's more like uh, relates to the quality of the food we eat in terms of how fresh it is, how you know it's grown in you know a healthy soil. But, uh, you know, how far it travels be before it gets to your plate, and the most important one, how processed it is uh, by the time you enter, uh, it enters your body, right? You, I've, I've, you know, spent time in other countries where, you know, your salad does not travel, uh, you know, on a truck or a plane 2,000 miles to get your plate. It's It just came from a local farmer because that's just how the environment sure. there works. So, you know, I think the larger issue really is that we have a toxic food culture, and this medication helps to sort of like battle the toxic food culture. But ultimately, the problem is a toxic food culture. This country did not need <coughs> GLP-1 agonists in the 1970s, right? But our obesity epidemic has gone to such proportions that we are considering like using a medicine just to lose weight, something that would be almost laughable in the 1960s, right? Well, you're taking a medicine to lose weight? I mean, that's weird, right? Unless it was You say a that, but I mean... You know, Fen Fen was there in the 80s, right? I mean, like, you know, there have, this is not like the first weight loss medication. The the idea or the need for weight loss medications, I think, is has been there for, for quite some time, right? And so right, I'm, no, but, I'm, I'm just a yeah, little yeah. bit mitigating that, that. But the core of what you're saying, I also have a bit of discomfort with the notion of this being lifelong, right? Um, now, what we again, what we don't have data on is, and, and this is something that's very prominent in the bodybuilder community, uh, that I have taken very deeply to heart in my calorie cutting process, is one of the big pieces of advice that that they they have discovered through hard trial and error, is that before you start a cut, you need an exit plan. Mm. What's your plan of coming off the cut, and so. The recommendation is that at least half the time that you were on the cut, so if you're on the cut for eight weeks, then we're talking about four weeks, right? You need to continue tracking your calories at maintenance. So you bump up so you're not losing weight anymore, but you continue the tracking process so you don't go above maintenance and regain, right? Mm -hmm. What we have not seen or what I have not seen, right, is data on people who taper, people who, you know, we we'll lose the weight, come down to 160, and then stay at 160 for, you know, let's say it took a year to lose it, stay at 160 for six months, mm -hmm. right? And then taper off the medication, right? Is there a difference in that protocol? Is there a difference in how they come off, right? Versus just, okay, hey, I lost 200 pounds, I'm at 160, stop medication, right? Those are different things. And, and, um, Again, you know, I don't know what the physiologic correlate is, but the way it's discussed in bodybuilding communities is you you have to anchor that set point for your body. Is hey, this is our new weight. This is our new maintenance calorie, right? And you have to kind of like your body's not used to that. Your body's used to the previous maintenance and wants to go find that again, right? So just left to its own devices, it's going to eat its way back to the previous weight, right? But you can anchor it by kind of using that period of time to retrain normal sure. for your body. And again, I, I think along with muscle mass preservation, um, those notions can become very important if we're talking about how to, how to come off this medication. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe it's a question of a physiological uh, steady state, you know, a, ba a new baseline that you have, you know, you sort of reset your, you know, sort of uh, um, homeostatic uh, weight, uh, perhaps. Uh, but, I, you know, I think perhaps the larger uh, alpha there to be gained is to sort of aim for a kind of almost psychological rebirth in your relationship to food and your relationship to your weight and your health, right? So I'm, I'm imagining the 400-pounder, right, you know, sitting in a sofa, eating pizza all the time, uh, who is now suddenly, because of this medication, now, you know, at a, at a, at a weight of 180. That, that is a journey. That is a psychological journey as well, 
right? And you change as a person. Not you're not. It's not just your body that changes. You change as a person because you there's some sense of accomplishment. There's some sense of that you know you've been freed from the shackles of you know your eating disorder and your your habits. And and then if you could capitalize on that, if you could double down on you know your sort of newfound confidence in yourself and say you know what I I I want to keep these hard earned gains. I don't want to be on this drug forever. And and now that I'm at this weight, I want to stay here. Right, I, I, I now have something to lose. Right, and no I think you intended. have to in your <laughs> 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 no pun intended. Yes, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've I've attained a state that I covet, and uh, I don't want to lose it. You know, uh, again. You know, uh, man. So, so I, you know, I, with I, with your I, own patients, you know, if, into some, if if you're dealing some with someone stuff. who's really obese, yeah. and then you bring them down, I, I think you should be trying throughout that journey to try to also inculcate good habits, right? As they, it's not just they're sitting in their couch injecting themselves once a week and, and they're letting the medicine do all the work, right? Um, well, that's got, that gets into so many aspects, right? In that the psychology of how you start may matter a tremendous amount for how you're able to finish. Mm. Meaning, is this, hey, I'm ready to start cutting calories, I'm ready to start working out, I'm ready to start exercising, and this is a tool to potentiate my efforts, right? Or is this a cheat code? Yeah. Because absolutely. if you perceive it as a cheat code, then you need the cheat code because you can't do it on your own. Right. Right? And so, yeah, I think that notion of figuring out, okay, hey, I'm going to perceive this as a tool that may may make these efforts more fruitful, may, make, may give me some some uh, initial startup energy may get the engine running, right? But I recognize that I'm going to have to take back over from this at some point. And so I need to go on this psychological journey to figure out how I'm going to do that while I'm losing this weight over the next three years or whatever the deal is or one year or however long it takes. I really am looking in the direction of changing my psychology, changing my relationship mm -hmm. with food, changing whatever the issues are there um, while this, while I have this around to help me out, um, yeah. but but you know, having like I like I said, having an exit plan before you start is important, right? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean the analogy is of course you know the uh, uh, patients who are addicted to opioids or or fentanyl or you know other those sort of drugs of abuse, you know they uh, take a medication called naltrexone, <laughs> right, which sort of mitigates mm -hmm. the high that they might feel if they were to reuse again. Not that, the, the, not that the naltrexone is doing all the hard work. You know, they still have to go through the... But it's just a little kind of extra pharmacological help as you, you know, do the hard inner journey that's required to try to, you know, grapple with your fentanyl addiction or your food addiction in the, in the case of, you know, the GLP-1 mm -hmm. agonist, right? It's, it's something that, you know, uh, maybe puts a bit of an accelerant on your efforts, right? And I think the larger point is that, you know, the, it, it always works better if you have a motivated patient, right? That's always the case, right? Um, and if you were to combine this with a motivated patient and you were to do it in a way that was very intentional about, you know, preventing muscle loss, uh, and, and you also were flexible with dosing, right? So you, you mitigate the potential side effects and use the bare minimum amount that you need. Uh, I think that could be a very powerful combination, right? You could, you could leverage this, you know, in, in the short term, work on your patient's psychology uh, and say, okay, a year out. Oh, you could even say, hey, listen, I'll prescribe this to you for a year. But then mm -hmm. after that, we're stopping, right? Because we don't know what yeah. the long-term side effects are, and I don't think you should be on this forever anyway, right? I think that's a good framing of like, you know, you know, trialing it out, right? We're going to use the lowest minimum dose. You're going to have to start lifting. We're stopping after X number of months. Well, it kind of, I mean, th there's a lot of interesting things there, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think the notion of saying, of setting a time limit, that's an interesting one, right? Um, you know, saying, hey, like, I'm willing to work with you on this, if you're willing to work with me on, 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 and I don't know that I would, actually, I'm, I'm, resi I'm resistant to the notion of making it contingent, Right, because again, as we've said, even if you lose the muscle loss, like you, 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 it's pro still probably net positive. So I don't know that I would make that a firm like deal, but but I'll just say it this way, even though probably I wouldn't pr prefer to do it this way. Like the notion that okay, hey, like we're gonna track your muscle mass, right? And and you need to do, be making efforts to preserve your muscle mass, right? So we need to find and and again adjusting the dose accordingly right? Where 
hey, we're not going to we're not going to give you such a high dose that the medicine does all the work for you. We're going to give you enough of a dose that your your efforts will work, right? But I want you working at it. I want you to be struggling with tracking the calories and with, you know, not such a high dose that maybe for a 400 pounder, but maybe not for somebody who's trying to lose 50 pounds or 20 pounds even, right? Say, okay, look, I'm not trying to hit a dose where this drug just makes it easy for you to not eat, right? I'm hit, trying to hit a dose where your intentional efforts will pay off a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that even, it, it circles back to the notion of what's the right dosing, right? It, the right dosing may not be the dose that makes the weight fall off. That may be the, that dosing, because it makes the weight almost fall off on its own, is exactly stripping the patient of their agency in the weight loss journey, mm-hmm. right? And so, hey, you, you might do better to do a lower dose where you have to work for it somewhat, but at least your work now starts paying off in a way maybe it wasn't yeah. before, yeah. But it's still your work, right? And and I don't know. I I've, I've <clears throat> quoted this recently to a patient. Actually, there's a great. I think it's Chris Williamson. Actually, um, who said, you know, the the six pack. If you have a six pack, it's written on your body the story of all the waffles you didn't eat, right? And I do think that if somebody lose, I think the perception of a cheat code or a cheat in general is that if you lose all this weight without doing any of the work. It wasn't that you used a tool. It was that you avoided the growth. Yeah, it's the difference between a tool and a crutch, right? And so using these as tools that still facilitate your psychological change in our in relation to food, in relation to this area of difficulty. And then if this gets the engine going and allows you to make that change, then awesome right? It's mm-hmm. a tool in the tool belt, use it, right? If on the other hand, you're like you said, a crutch, if you're, if you're using a dose that becomes, well, I can't lose weight without this, then you've, you've avoided exactly the thing you needed to be doing on some level. And you can't yeah. come off it then. Then it's yeah. a lifelong medication. That's right. Yeah. That's um, right. Maybe, maybe that's an interesting balance, right? Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and, other, and because, uh, and because yeah. at the end, when you have lost the weight, you want to be able to look at your body and say, I did that, not the drug did that, right? Right, because, and, because you and, have more confidence, right, that uh, you have, you know, your character was involved in the creation yeah. of this uh, result, right? Whereas if it was all the drug and all you did is sit on the couch, you know, and watch uh, TV all day and slowly lost weight and muscle— you don't really have any confidence in yourself. Like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I can stop the drug and everything will be fine. That's, you know, you're just going to go back to your old habits, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, using it as a tool, right, in a, a more holistic kind of, you know, uh, a reframing and, and a re-sort of orientation of your relationship with food and eating and health uh, is perhaps important, right? And, you know, I, I think a lot of people are just down the obesity gravity well, <laughs> right, no pun intended, where they're just stuck, right? And yeah. Uh, this kind of might just get them unstuck. And getting unstuck, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a tremendous amount of value in getting unstuck, right? And that's, I think, one of the cu- one of the great uses of these medications is getting people unstuck, right? The, the danger with anything is then it becoming a crutch, but that's mm-hmm. also something that you just have to mitigate. It's not don't use it because it might become a crutch. Like, that's a terrible, like, that's just a fear-mongering kind of approach. It's like, no, 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 use it, get unstuck, be aware that there is also this psychological risk oh and and a pit there's a pitfall to avoid there right there's another yeah. thing there's another trap to avoid in the process you know I, I definitely think that if you are a primary care physician or a concierge physician as you are and you are starting a medication like this on a patient uh what i i know for sure is happening today is you have you know thousands of PCPs or obesity <laughs> clinics blindly prescribing this without any conversation with the patient. And that's how about we got muscle. it. Right? That's... But yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's how we exactly got it. Right. We yeah, we yeah, basically totally. just went online and uh, you know filled out a form and uh, you know someone just mailed it to us, right? Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, even if you were to go to your doctor, right, it would just, there would be no conversation about like, you know, let's talk about the plan of getting off. Let's talk about your muscle mass. Let's talk about, you know, uh, what exercise regimen you're going to be involved in and, you know, what, how, you know, how to use a minimum viable dose. And none of that is happening. It's not tailored at all. And I'm absolutely protein positive intake, you, you have mil- in protein intake. You have millions of patients that are being prescribed this thoughtlessly. Uh, by their physicians without any kind of regard for let's try to titrate down, let's try to get you off, let's talk about your diet regimen, you know, has anything changed in the kind of quality of food you're eating? Have you started exercising more? When are we going to start tapering off? Would you like to go down on the dose next year, next month to see if the, you know, yeah. it works just as well. None of those conversations are happening because, you know, uh, most physicians are just, you know, pressing the, the button, you know, just cookie cutter medicine, like, oh, obesity, semaglutide. And that's, that's as much as, that's as much thinking as they do. And then they yeah. basically fo- follow the manufacturer's like prescription guidelines, like you're just s- scaling up to 20 units or whatever the units is per the GLP-1 agonist. And just like blindly just letting that be. Right, um, which of course is our frustration with modern medicine in in the U.S. Right, it's very thoughtless. It's it's or, not or by contrast doing the the Peter Atia thing you pointed out, right, which is not prescribing it for obesity because oh you might lose muscle mass, right, exactly. uh, the, and as if there's this is an unmitigatable factor, right, yeah. uh, or something new with this particular yeah. medication rather than any method of calorie reduction and weight loss, which is going to cause muscle mass loss right yeah um and totally. by the way it's important to, it's important to emphasize that too is that the degree of muscle mass loss was consistent with calorie reduction it was not in any way sort of like different than what we've seen in other yeah. calorie reduction uh experiments right yeah. the glp when agonists um, don't have some special unique effect on the muscle that causes correct. more muscle mass loss versus if you just like stopped eating less you know of your own accord, right? Correct. Yeah. Which exactly. is why it's a reasonable guess, although it is a guess, and I would prefer to see data, but it's a reasonable guess for that reason to suspect that eating more protein, lifting, will mitigate the loss yeah. just as it does for other methods of calorie reduction, right? Now, I prefer to see data on that. Rather, you know, I would not, I would not want to be, I would not want to swear to that because we haven't seen data, right? But the reason it's reasonable is because we have seen this in other areas, right? And and the the, the core principle seems to simply be calorie reduction. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I will say, I think emphasizing also the low ask is important, right? Is say, hey, there's seven days a week, you pick one muscle group per day, right? Or one, you know, you push, pull, and then one day off totally. Like push, pull, and, and every joint, basically, like you do one exercise, two failure, mm-hmm once a week, right? Or pick one day and you're just going to do every muscle group. It's going to take you two hours probably in the gym that one day. And that's your mm-hmm. workout for the week, right? <clears throat> and yeah. that would be enough. Like, okay, that would it's be a enough, long yeah. workout. But, Especially but, if you're on zero, right? You've never yeah. like, lifted a thing in your life, right? And You'll probably gain muscle, going. actually. If you've yeah, never, if you've never lifted exactly. before, you yeah. would probably over... I mean... The newbie gain phenomenon, yeah. like, it, it ju- you know, new resistance training is incredibly strong. If you're eating enough protein and you're a new lifter that's not actually lifted before, the muscle generation stimulus is quite profound, even if you're in a calorie deficit. Yeah. Like, you you could, uh, you know, I, again, I don't have data, so I wouldn't, I would hesitate to, but my, my, I would also not be surprised if data comes out that says, oh, actually, the people who actually lift gain muscle instead of losing it. Um, yeah. but, uh, could go either way, I guess, but, but I would not be surprised if that, if that result mm-hmm. came out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that these three categories are, 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 you know, we added an additional bucket there of the psychology, I think, which is an important one. And, and I'd like to actually talk about that a little bit further, but those three categories of, of muscle gain, muscle loss and the mitigations for muscle loss, um, you know the the psychological aspect that we that we talked about, um, and you know then then the optimizer dose bucket. You know those yeah. three questions, I think, are a bit unanswered in to in their totality, right? And and that second one, although I put it out of order, I guess that's the third one technically. Um, 
of, of the psychology to me is probably going to be the most important and the most overlooked in all of the, in all of the discussions of this. Um, that notion that, hey, if you're not going to take this for lifelong, and maybe that's not a great idea, then you have to be a different person at yeah. the end of it. And what are we doing about that? How yeah. are we talking about that? What, what are we, you know, uh, you know, so many things matter, right? I mean, you know, this, uh, uh, clinically, right, is if you have a, a, a couple, uh, you know, husband and wife, and one of them wants to lose weight, but the other doesn't, is really you know that's not going to happen. It, it's very unlikely to happen because there's too much overlap in lifestyle. There's too much need for well, uh, she's not working out. She's just watching TV. I'm just going to watch. The motivation threshold is so much higher than if both people are going on the journey together. That's just one example of how the the psychology and the social connection and the the social milieu you and i talk all the time about these notion of third spaces and mm. and community right one of the one of the reasons crossfit w works so well despite being rather cultish is because it's cultish yeah. it creates a community it creates a sense of doing this with a social support network and you can criticize all you want the particular implementations but for, well, first of all, there's a certain logic to it, which I, which I think is, the parts of it are, are tremendously valid. But regardless, that social element is critical and really important for generating the results that they generate. Um, and that's one aspect of psychology. And then other aspects of psychology is self-identity. Do I identify as a healthy athletic person? Right? Mm -hmm. Is that how I see myself? Am I willing to... Uh, maybe I've never been at a healthy weight and now I'm trying for the first time to get to a healthy weight. But I've always been, I, I had that, I mean, I, I'm being just totally open. I, I had that, I was very, not overweight, but I was I was uh, skinny and not athletic. And I had asthma as a kid. Um, and I was not athletic. Uh, and so in many ways, I still struggle to define myself as an athlete, even though I lift a ton now. And, you know, I've done CrossFit and martial arts and X, Y, and Z. Like, now the you know now it's starting to sink in after maybe 10 years of doing this that mm. oh maybe you're an athletic person and part of that also is other people see me that way yeah. you know I go, I go out on a date and somebody's like oh you're really fit you're really athletic like oh okay let me reevaluate my entire self image right um because that wasn't who i was in formative years right yeah i mean we often uh, our our self image is uh a reflection of how other people see us, right, uh, to a large extent. That's part of it. And, and, and you know, and the, there's the notion is choose very carefully who you allow to be a mirror for you. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, we don't have choices in childhood. You know, our parents are chosen for us. Our schools are chosen for us. Our peer groups in many ways are not within our control, right? Um, but when you do get a chance to choose... It's one of the most important choices you can make is, is mm. who, who am I going to spend time around? I mean, I love that saying, right? You're the average of the five people you spend the most time around, right? Um, and there's a tremendous amount of truth in it. And, yeah, and then sure. even if you're forced to spend time maybe with somebody that's not that healthy or you're forced, quote unquote, um, be conscientious of saying, okay, this is not who I want to be my mirror. This is not what I want to em emulate. Um, and, and that over there is, and maybe, you know, I want to spend a little bit more time soaking it in. Even these conversations, right? You and I have tried Ozempic. We're both physicians. Like, you know, we've, we've experimented with it personally. We've seen it with patients. We've read studies. And we talk about it. Part of the reason we started this podcast is because we've had all these conversations about it, right? But we've also had a ton of conversations about, oh, man, my lift's not going really well. Why do you think that is? Do you think I'm not taking enough calories? Should I be eating more? Pro this is just the fact that you and I are constantly conversing means that we are anchoring each other on a goal. We're mm -hmm. anchoring each other on, hey, I want to be more fit. I want to gain muscle. I want to lose weight. And you and I have different preferred body types, I think, for ourselves. I think, you know, our goals are a little different, but the notion of hitting an ideal aesthetic goal, yeah. right? Or, or moving in that direction, at least. Um, a lot of our conversation 
circles around that. And because of that social support, criticism, debate, discussion, commiseration, milieu of all of the things um, is tremendously powerful for getting there and, and anchoring that identity uh, on, that, on that value. Is that, no, I do value the notion of my identity as a fit, healthy person, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and some of the actions are going to the gym and eating certain ways, but some of the actions are also, who do I spend time with? Who do I spend time talking to? That's also an action on that, on that value, on that identity. Yeah, no, totally agree, man. <clears throat> totally agree. Uh, any other uh, uh, final thoughts about uh, GLP? No, I think I we... Uh, actually, uh, the one final thought uh, mm -hmm. on the notion of um, protein intake. Um, protein is also a satiety trigger, right? And so there is this interesting tension on if I'm making this global switch. So say, okay, I'm deciding I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to use the GLP-1 as a tool, right? But I'm also going to try and protect my muscle mass. I'm going to start doing one or two sets per muscle group per week. I'm do all the things that we talked about. You may really genuinely end up needing a lower dose than you think because of the, the satiating impulse of changing to that high of a protein intake um, in, order to, in order to not end up in a 1,500 calorie deficit. You don't want that big of a deficit, right? Sure. If you want a 500 calorie deficit and lose the weight gradually, 1% per week is the usual upper limit of, of what's discussed, maybe 2% per week if you're, if you're obese. But that's a very, you know, 2% per week is an aggressive goal. But uh, yeah, it, it, if you're doing that while taking in enough protein to mitigate muscle loss, uh, these agents may prevent you from taking in that much protein. And that's an interesting uh, conundrum that I myself ran into was hey, you know, if I'm taking this agent and I get full really fast, well, that one protein shake with 40 grams of protein, I'm full for hours, right? Um, even on a pretty low dose. And so mm -hmm. there is a bit of a tension there in terms of like making both switches as we've described it yeah, uh, and finding the right dose of the GLP-1. <clears throat> so, in fact, I'd go as far as to say that, you know, when I took the... Uh, Ozempic, my mindset was I'm putting a foreign substance in my body. I had better make sure like I, I, I don't, you know, I, I also like maximize my chances of this thing working by eating as little processed food as possible. I mean, for me now, you know, in terms of what, what constitutes healthy eating, I really moved away from, you know, thinking about macros as like, oh, it really matters how much protein. You, I, I think protein is important. You have to have a high amount of protein. But I don't really think it's any more about like, oh, it should be this much carbs versus this much. I think just like a just a balanced sort of diet, you know, tending towards high protein is where it starts and stops. And I think the larger question really is to what how many of your calories you're consuming come from processed foods versus non-processed foods. I think there's something about processed foods that just causes the, you know, sort of food toxicity or, or just kind of causes the problems that we are running into with the obesity epidemic. Uh, and we probably so haven't you actually say that, impact. I've gone we in the exact unpacked. opposite direction. Oh, interesting. I've actually okay. moved, yeah, yeah. I've moved very, I've moved much more away from this uh, notion of clean eating, which I actually mm. a little bit object to the term now. Um, oh, toward a very macro-driven view. There's a couple of reasons for that. I think in the last five to 10 years, multiple studies have kind of come out saying that calories and protein is the thing doing the work. Whatever your justification, if you... And there's actually a great... There's a, a professor uh, 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 who uh, went on a Twinkie diet, or yep. I think it was a gas station diet, I right? Heard. And yep. it's like, okay, look, hey, and you lost calorie weight. reduction, right? And lost weight. And yep. so uh, I... I, I don't want to overstate the case. I do think that highly processed and highly palatable foods can make it harder to uh, limit your calories because you will still often be hungry after consuming them. So there is, there is, and again, this so the GLP ones can come and like help with your satiety and so on and so forth. But regardless, I think there is some satiety issue there. If you're, I mean, I imagine that guy must have been starving. Like, you know, if you're just eating gas station food and still in a calorie deficit, 
he just has a high tolerance for being really hungry, I think, right? Um, but, uh, uh, and I do think whole foods are overall probably more filling per calorie. So yeah. satiety per calorie, totally, right? But the thing doing the work is the calories and protein. And so for me, um, in terms of my global sense of pleasure in life, I have found that making space for a certain amount of processed food is absolutely critical. And in fact, quite a bit of, in, in a strict sense, quite a bit of processed food in the sense that I take in multiple protein shakes per day to hit my calorie targets. Um, you count that as and, processed food too? I do. Protein shake? Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I mean, think it's fair to count it as yeah, processed food. I mean, food. it's sure. to be totally fair, the ones I've chosen, the, uh, which I, I love, the Fairlife uh, uh, brand, uh, the ultra processed, the, the high, or the ultra concentrated 42 grams per, per bottle. Um, but it's, it's milk at the end of the day. It's just concentrated milk, right? Um, and so to what degree is that processed? Well, it is processed. I mean, it's concentrated. It's it not is. milk. It's, it's processed, it processed, right? processed, yeah. Um, and it's sweetened and it's, it's chocolate and vanilla totally. and whatever, right? So mm -hmm. um, uh, now is it, uh, it's an interesting distinction too. Is it natural? Yeah, for the most part it is, <laughs> right? Like uh, it's chocolate, vanilla, sweetener, and, and milk, right? Are the ingredients on some level, right? I, I mean, there's also um, a lot of like things that- So a bunch of distinctions that you can kind of- Yeah, but there's also like totally, a whole bunch totally. of chemicals that keep it, you know, shell, give it a sure, prolonged sure, shelf sure. life. And, and that's sure. kind of the, 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 that's a whole problem with the processed food, you know, movement is they put stuff in there so that uh, the entire- food distribution network can, you know, work better, right? If, if, you, sure. if the food is going to spoil in four days, the, the system doesn't work, right? Because Correct. the food is coming from 2,000 miles away. The economies don't work anymore, right? The food don't work anymore. Totally. If you can't keep it fresh for longer. And that's really where processed food sort of uh, runs awry. So I, I've used these protein shakes as well. And when I take them, I'm like, okay, this is my, like, this is the processed food I'm eating for the day right? Mm. Uh, everything else is clean, but I'm allowing myself this because it's just a, you know, it's, it's the trade-off seems to be worth it, right? And it's the yeah, only process. I aim process for that to be the today. least processed thing I eat. Yeah. <laughs> and then the whole point of eating that is to make room for the processed food. No, uh, no, no. I'm joking. I, I'm joking yeah. a little bit, but I, but I am a little bit serious. Like, you know, if I, uh, you know, for instance, one of my common repetitive days on this calorie counting cut that I've done is two of those 42 gram Fairlife protein shakes through the day and then a chipotle you know burrito bowl with extra chicken which hits about 170 grams of protein about 170 mm -hmm. centimeters tall um and it's roughly a thousand calories right now that leaves me with 600 700 calories to eat crap right so then I have cookies or I have, you know, whatever I want for 600 calories, right? Um, and my experience of that is that it is much more psychologically satiating. I don't feel deprived. There's nothing I can't eat because I can eat anything in that 600 calories, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that, that day of eating works really, really well because it builds in a certain amount of flexibility for the processed, palatable foods that satiate me psychologically. Um, and that's maybe the distinction is that like, I, I don't necessarily even require physical satiation so much as psychological satiation of my sweet tooth or, you know, whatever else. And so... Now, there's other days that work, right? So if I, I've also, so I mentioned General Tso's chicken, right? So like mm. if I have three of those protein shakes during the day, then I can have a General Tso's chicken with, what, with a cup of white rice, right? One serving, which works out to around 1,100 calories. And I've got 500 calories still to play with, right? And so, yeah, I've moved in the direction very strongly of kind of a macro perception um, and, and I mean, I, don't, I just throw it back to you for a second, but I actually also have critiques of my own method there. So I, I'll, I'll, I don't know if you have any other thoughts before I start. No, I, I think, myself. uh, 
<clears throat> this kind of comes down to our, you know, differences in personalities where you are more of a sensualist, right? You enjoy the, the, the junk food or the cookie that you're going to eat and yes, you feel like I it's do. really important to keep that in, in life. Whereas, you know, like when I when I go for work sometimes and it's really busy, um, I do my own cooking. And like there have been days, 10 days in a row where I eat exactly the same thing. And it's basically just minced meat and rice, right? And uh, cooked in oh, maybe God. there's some butter in there and a protein no, shake, I right? Think... It's that 10 days yeah, in a yeah, row. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I throw in like some mushrooms in there, but the, it's like four ingredients, right? And it takes 20 minutes to make in the mornings, right? And I'm yeah. perfectly satisfied, you know, and, and, I, and I'm like, wow, this is, I'm getting, you know, the, the right macros, you know, that, I, that I'm interested in, the right amount of carbs. It's not processed except for the protein shakes. And I, and, and, and I notice that I feel better, right? One of my issues with processed food is like mm. if I did the Chipotle thing, right, I'm going to get massive bloating, uh, you know, within hours, I've noticed that every time I go to like Chipotle or Qdoba or really eat any kind of like, you know, food from outside, <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, my, my gut flora, I don't know what it is, um, but my body doesn't let me get away with it. Like I, I'm bloated right away, right? There's something in the food mm. that just causes me to feel uncomfortable. Whereas if I just, you know, you you know, know I, minimize the processed we, food, then I don't feel as We talked a lot bloating. about this, but it, it's an interesting notion, right? And it gets back into the psychology of food, like... Um, you know, you and I have a friend, Jassim, who, who, who more than anyone else I know has psychologically adjusted, I, probably, I don't know that it was intentional, but has adjusted his genuine perception of taste to his psychological perception of the healthiness of the food. <laughs> like his, his genuine, oh, if he sells me like, oh, that restaurant is so good, what it means is it's really healthy food. Right? Yeah, it's sourced yeah. locally, it's not cooked with canola oil, whatever, whatever in his mind constitutes healthy or clean eating, his taste preference is oriented there. That's what he means by taste. And I'll go to the restaurant and be like, this tastes like shit, because it just tastes like shit, right? I don't care how healthy it is, it doesn't taste yeah. that good, right? And so, yeah, I'm much, much more, as you said, much more of a sensualist about the notion of flavorful eating, even if it's processed, even if it's, you know, French sauced within its, an inch of its life, you know, um, absolutely give me the, the buttercream sauce, you know, whatever. Um, and, and I, by a similar token, something you and he share is this sense of feelings about food. I don't feel, I could eat donuts, and coffee every day, all day, and I, I have actually at periods in my life, and I feel great. I feel phenomenal, actually. Like I'm alert, I'm sharp, I'm with it. Oddly enough, it's it. I'm less sharp when I'm eating healthy because I'm dedicating some brain space to figuring out what I'm going to eat. But like, right. you know, I mean, through all, I mean, I gained a ton of weight in undergrad, uh, from where I started to where I finished. Uh, you know, and and that weight gain was kind of the trigger for a lot of this health journey through med starting in med school and go going forward. But, um, but yeah, man, I mean, it was, I drank two liters of Dr. Pepper a day, like a day, like every day there were like wow. liters of Dr. Pepper, like, you know, Snickers and candy and fast food. Like that was my entire diet. And I felt fucking phenomenal. Like mentally I was, I was, way sharper than that I am now mm. for sure right mm. now maybe an age effect as well <laughs> but but uh you know I did not perceive and still don't perceive any slowdown when I binge or when I like when I my birthday or whatever I kind of like for a day I'll throw the diet aside or whatever the deal is and have a donut or have whatever I feel great I feel mm. phenomenal like I, I have no which which is a bit of a problem right because uh, oddly yes. enough uh you know, there's no negative feedback loop there. No, right? that's uh, what it, I'm saying. It has is, to be uh, imposed externally yes, by yeah. by my intellect, <clears throat> right? Yeah. And I, yeah. I will say that that is one thing I'm I'm proud of in some sense is you know the body that I have to the degree that I am fit is an expression of my intellect purely. There's there's not a there's not a, a, a feedback loop that I could rely on. I don't like exercise. I've never gotten a runner's high in my life. I've done Murph. I've done CrossFit. I've done insane workouts. Never gotten a high. I hated every second of it. I still hate every second of it. It is just, I'm going to grind this out 
on the basis of my intellectual assertion that this is the direction I want to go. Mm. And I do take a bit of pride in that, right? Like that, that I don't, I don't have those positive feedback feelings. Oh, I feel great. Oh, I feel so healthy. Like, no, nah, I feel kind of tired and yeah. worn out. No, we're definitely great. different that way. You know, like that's, this is one of the reasons I completely stopped uh, drinking even any small amounts of alcohol, right? Because if I would, I, I noticed immediately my sleep just went down the toilet. Even if it was just a glass of wine, <clears throat> my sleep would be immediately disrupted and then I wouldn't feel well the next day. And I'm like, well, what's the point of that, right? Uh, so just not worth the trade-off. And it's similar with, you know, if I'm eating a lot of junk food or, you know, a, a very common one, if I if I eat right before I go to sleep, my, my sleep just goes down the toilet. So part of my good sleep hygiene is to, like, not eat several hours at least, you know, at least several hours before I go, ideally five hours, really before I go to sleep uh, that's usually yeah, when I mean, my sleep is a big part of my, a big part of my sleep hygiene is is lying down in bed <laughs> at whatever time in whatever condition I choose to lie yeah, down yeah, in bed and we're different that and way that's, that's, yeah, I, yeah, mean, yeah, totally. I actually no, think it's a it. good thing to have a tight feedback loop like that because I, I tell <laughs> myself like my body doesn't let me get away with anything like I, I immediately yeah. feel bad right like uh, this is probably why like I have you know I, I have these sleep apps on my phone then my like sleep scores are like in the ninety second percentile or something, right? Because I'm just so deliberate about it, right? Because I, yeah, yeah, if yeah. I'm not, then I just feel like crap the next day. So in some say, you know, I'm in the t- ten, nine, you know, ninetieth plus percentile of like sleep quality of the people out That's there. That's another great example, right? Because yeah. it's not, it's not that I, I, I sleep great every mm-hmm. night. I just don't care. Like it just doesn't mm-hmm. bother me to like. Sometimes I sleep four hours, and I wake up, you know, I wake up at four in the morning, or sometimes I go to bed at three and I wake up at eight or it's a very, you know, I mean like, mm-hmm. but I feel the same. I, I basically like, you know, I wake up when I wake up, you know, thankfully I have a lifestyle that allows that for the most part. Um, you know, if I have to set an alarm, it's a bit different, right? So I will say, you know, when I'm doing my hospital shifts, for instance, and I actually have to be there at 7 a.m. So I have to wake up at six and I have to do whatever. Um, it's a bit different because I still am on, you know, I still tend to fall asleep at midnight or one, and then I'm waking up by force at 6 a.m., whether I want to or not. Um, but even then, my perception is I'm tired for about the first hour, right? So the first dragging myself out of bed, I feel it. Um, by the time I'm in the hospital, I feel no different. Hmm. Like, and, and so it really is just an hour a day that, like, the most effect that that sleep will have on me is about an hour a day. Now, in residency, we obviously had much more extreme sleep deprivation than that. And certainly, sure. if I've been up for 30 hours, I am feeling it like, you know, like anyone else, right? But But the difference there between you and I, at least in those circumstances, what I remember is, yes, I would feel it, but I didn't, like, I was sleepy and tired, but I didn't perceive that super negatively. I didn't perceive that as suffering. Right. Mm-hmm. That feeling of fatigue is not as acutely painful to me as I think it is to you. That's my perception. Yeah. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I think that's accurate. Right. I, I think I, 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 I go slower. I feel less motivated at times. And uh, like today is a good example. I don't think I slept well last night. I just kind of woke up feeling very groggy. Um, and, you know, that's annoying, right? Because there's like things I'd like to do and I, I'm not doing them as fast as I'd like to do them. And, that creates a sort of like an irritation loop, you know, like, yeah, well, yeah that's the thing. Along. I never do anything as fast as I want to do it. So that I'm just, <laughs> you know, my, I've embraced my essential laziness. And so there's <laughs> just, uh, uh, maybe that's the, the key is just to accept that I'm, I'm yeah. not, you know, if I can barely yeah. accomplish what I need to, to meet my minimum <laughs> goals, that's a good day. That's, yeah, uh, I think this would be a good uh, <laughs> note to wrap on your inherent laziness. And, uh, yes, that's uh, yes. Yeah.